And now before we hear scripture from both Old and New Covenants, I will begin with a prayer of illumination that our eyes, ears, and hearts might truly be open, which they can be if we ask the Spirit to help us. Holy God, we humbly approach your word today. Help us not only to hear the message you intend for us, but to embody your word in our daily lives and action. Amen. Our first passage today comes from the book of Joshua. This is from the first chapter of Joshua. As the transition is taking place between the leadership of Moses and Joshua. Today's passage are instructions to Joshua, who has assumed the heavy mantle of leadership from the great Moses. God's instructions to him and to all of us in how we should live this life. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Be not frightened, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you you go. And then from the Psalter, from the 33rd Psalm, the same theme, the psalmist writes, let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be, commanded and it stood forth. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to naught. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands for every, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Thus ends the scripture readings from the Old Covenant. Moving now to the New Testament, I'm reading from the letter of Paul to the church at Romans. I would dare say that for most practicing Christians, almost the entire eighth chapter of Romans is familiar. And I'm sure you have, most of you have heard many of these words before, but ask God to give you new insight today. Paul explains to the Roman Christians and through scripture to us today, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sight and sighs too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts of men knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that in everything, God works for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And those who he, he predestined, he also called and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also will glorify. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let us stand together and sing our faith in our second hymn, number 85, paying particular lyrics, uh, attention, I hope, to these lyrics. Let us stand together and sing.
seated. And now before preaching the Word, I ask that we would turn to God once more to prepare our hearts for this message. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts here together this day be found acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our strength and salvation, our rock and redeemer. In the power of Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is part five of the Lenten sermon series that we have shared throughout this time of Lent. And today we move in history to the time that Presbyterians came to the new world, to this country. And so many of them did that, and they brought their faith with them. And after they erected their log cabins or whatever crude thing they built to live in, the first thing they built was a church, which doubled as a school, which tripled as a community center, could come together for the people throughout the week. So Presbyterians went forth with their Protestant work ethic with them and came to this country. Now, those of you that might be observant might have noticed that there are four ties here on the pulpit this morning since we are dealing with Scotland. Uh, I was really blessed in the summer of 1994. Nancy and the girls and I went and did a pulpit exchange in Scotland. We served two churches in Ayrshire, one at Maybole and one at Fisherton, and got to spend that time with those people. We lived in the Scottish minister's manse and drove the Scottish minister's little car. Meanwhile, the Stewart family, John Stewart and his wife and daughters came to Knoxville, lived in the Greystone Presbyterian manse, drove our car and served the Greystone church. It was just a wonderful experience. And while there, I was presented with several gifts from the church, and these are reflected here. This one tie that is blue with light blue stripes running through it is the official tie of the Church of Scotland. In Scotland, the church is the state church, the Presbyterian church. On the bottom of it, you can find the thistle and the uh, thorn that's the subject of Scottish history. If you want to come up after the uh, message and look at these, you can. These other two ties, this is the dress tartan of the clan McFarland, of which I am a member through my mother's lineage. And this other tie is the hunting tartan, also of the McFarland clan. My mother really wanted me to get a quilt, a kilt, but I just couldn't think of a place that I could wear it. And they were so expensive, I turned her down, and I think I might have disappointed her. I probably just should have gone ahead and done it, but I'm not too comfortable in a skirt. This tie was given to me, and this is called the clergy tartan. This tie and this tartan represent clergy at the Church of Scotland. And so if a person is wearing this tie, they are immediately recognized as a minister of the church. And it's an interesting dynamic there in Scotland, which we'll share more about later. But we talked today about our Presbyterian progress into the new world. As Protestant believers all over Europe found new freedom in their faith, Western Europe was still under the thumb of royal and papal absolute authority. The power came from just a very few filtered down to everyone, and many people, the vast majority of people, had no hope of ever rising above the class to which they were born in, of getting an education, of doing anything for a living other than what their parents could teach them how to do. And so as people thought about their own freedom in Christ, when we think about the book of Galatians, they wanted more freedom too. These first pioneers to the new world across the great Atlantic Ocean were faith-based in their expeditions. Let me name just a few of those to you. We know the pilgrims came and settled in Massachusetts. 
If you went to elementary school, you probably cut out turkeys and pilgrim hats and all those things. These pilgrims were English Puritans. They came for religious freedom. English people also came from the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And they settled in many places, but most notably early in Georgia, the state of Georgia, where they were led by a great man named Oglethorpe. Then the German Lutherans came to Pennsylvania, and Quakers also and Presbyterians also settled in that area of the New World along the coast. The Baptists came under the leadership of a man named Roger Williams and settled Rhode Island, where they could practice their Baptist faith without fear of repercussion. The Roman Catholic Church came also. Many of them went to Maryland, where they were led in their settlement by Lord Baltimore, an English lord who was a Roman Catholic individual. Jews also came to the New World seeking religious freedom and settled in several different places and for the first time had the ability to worship their God in their way without being persecuted for it. Judged they were, but persecuted, thankfully, no. We know that many Presbyterians came from Ireland and Scotland to what was then the state of Carolina. There was no South and North. It was just Carolina. They also uh, went to Pennsylvania and settled there. The first organized presbytery in the colonies uh, was, in, was founded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1706. That's 60 years before the revolution happened. So we were here early. And a man from Ireland named the Reverend Francis McCamey came and was the first established Presbyterian minister in this country, in the colonies. Francis McCamey had a great influence over his people and the education that they had. Now we must remember here that as the migration of people moved westward, the churches went with them. And the Presbyterian church was often a little bit behind because we kept our ordination standards for clergy. The Presbyterian church insisted that ministers be educated, highly educated, and able to read Latin, to read Hebrew in the Old Testament, to read Greek in the New, which required years of training. And there weren't that many Presbyterian ministers there. So because of this, as the frontier moved westward, a group of Presbyterians decided, no, we don't really need to have that much education. We'll start our own denomination, which has lesser standards so that we can go with the frontier. And thus was born the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. All these folks, regardless of their national origin or their denomination, were willing to risk their lives, and I mean quite literally, risk their lives to have, first, religious freedom. Second, they wanted economic opportunity and the chance to make their way as well as they could without being subjected to class thinking. They wanted the chance to own their own land because after living for all those centuries as vassals under the feudal system where they were just slaves on the land in which they worked, they wanted their own land. And that's what made the frontier move ever westward. And they also wanted to be free from laws that kept them oppressed. Indeed, they were willing to step out in faith and trust in God and move ahead. They believed in the Old Testament admonition read to Joshua about his instructions. They believed that they should step forward in courage and in good faith and trust God and move forward, which they did. And they faced lots of opposition, as we know. But these pioneers were really amazing, strong people. And one subject that's overlooked often in the westward movement and the strength of the pioneers is pioneer women. Pioneer women had to be really tough and self-reliant and independent. They had to take on themselves 
so much responsibility because often their husbands or fathers or brothers were out hunting, getting things, and they were not at home. And these women were the ones that really put things together. You heard me read the passages from both Testaments that encourages us to be strong and of good courage and to trust in God. Now, time today only permits a brief overview of these Presbyterian pioneers. So let's focus on those that came here. And here I mean Southern Appalachia, where we live, because at one time this was the Western frontier. As an example this morning, I will use pastoral license or homiletical license to concentrate on two people, both elders, one a layman and one ordained clergy. We will talk today about the elder, Robert McFarland, and also about the minister, the Reverend Samuel Doak. Some of you might have heard of Samuel Doak, who among other things founded Tusculum College and many other things. We need to remember the Presbyterian Church was here in the, in the American scene and in the country before the state of Tennessee existed when this was still what was called the state of Franklin. There are churches right in our region that have long histories. The New Providence Church in Sergoinsville, 1783. The Hopewell Church in Dandridge, which I served for 10 years, was founded in 1785. That was before Tennessee was Tennessee. The Salem Church in Limestone, Tennessee, also from the 1700s. And these Presbyterians led in many ways in education and others. They were also, many of them, soldiers in the American Revolution. Some of you might know that they gathered together up at Sycamore Shoals in Elizabethan as Americans, and they marched over the mountain in the Carolina to King's Mountain, where they defeated the British in a battle that they were not supposed to have a chance in, and it really turned the tide of the war. Let's talk just a second about Robert McFarland. Robert McFarland and his brother came from Scotland. They went from Scotland to Northern Ireland, where they worked for a while and saved their money. And then they finally got enough to get passage to come to the New World. And they arrived here in the Carolinas with nothing in their pocket but a willingness to go to work. These brothers did not want to work for somebody else. They did not want to rent where they lived. They wanted to do their own thing, make their own livage, and, and earn enough to live in a house that they owned. And so they moved west with the frontier and came to what is now Jefferson and Hamblin counties in East Tennessee. There's a historical marker uh, in Jefferson County about Robert McFarland. He was elected at Sycamore Shoals by his fellow people to be an officer in that group of overmountain men that went to fight the British. He was very successful and quite distinguished. As time went on and the Revolutionary War was over, all those who had fought for the American side were given land grants, acres and acres of land given to them free for their service to the country. And McFarland and his brother received uh, land grants of hundreds of acres of beautiful bottom land on the French Broad River. McFarland later became the first sheriff of Jefferson County. And as sheriff, it was his responsibility to dispense justice. Now, as I said, this was rough. This was the frontier. It was hard times. And they did not take it easy on people that broke the law. There were stocks there in Jefferson County where the people would come with their heads and their arms, you know, through, and people could come and throw garbage on them or whatever they wanted to do. One of McFarland's jobs as the sheriff was to whip them when that was necessary, which must have been a terrible thing to have to do. Remember, this was a time when if you stole a person's horse, you were executed as soon as you were caught. There was no waiting around. You were tried on the spot, convicted, and usually hung. So McFarland and his family grew and infl influenced, and his descendants uh, numbered in greater and greater numbers. Now, Samuel Doak was a Presbyterian minister, educated at Princeton in New Jersey, 
So he had learned the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin, and he came to East Tennessee to begin churches and to found schools. He was the founder of Tusculum College in Greenville, which was founded in 1794 by Dr. Doak. He also founded several churches in the area, including Salem in Limestone. Some of you might not remember, probably most of you don't, but many years ago, right here at Bethel, a play was given about Samuel Doak and that history. And your minister at that time, my friend Martin Stokes, played Samuel Doak. He was the lead and was, he became Samuel Doak. I was fortunate enough to be in that play and get to play Hezekiah Balk, who was another Presbyterian minister who often disagreed with Doak. And we've sort of brought that alive. But I hope this history is topical for you. And I realize that I'm more into this than many people. Remember the Scots-Irish valued education. As I said, wherever they went, they built a church. They built a school or an academy. And they built a seminary after they had enough time to get to that level. We remember that they were marked by their independence, their self-reliance. They were righteous people, particularly in their own eyes. They thought that they were right about what they believed. They were also known to be stubborn, sometimes even contrary. Also known as clannish, gathering in groups and families. And they were willing to fight if they thought they were wrong. They were also willing to fight if they wanted something that somebody else had. That's just the truth. They ran the Indians, the Cherokee, right out of this beautiful land in which they'd lived for many, many centuries and generations. We think of the old school Presbyterians. How many of you have heard of a blue stocking Presbyterian? That is a person who is a Presbyterian, usually a lady, that believes in Calvinist principles and is very strict on how those things should be handled. So we see that as the Presbyterians came, they did bring a lot with them. And we are the descendants of that to this day. I could go on and on about Presbyterians and what they did. But suffice it to say that we come from a faith tradition that we can look back on and be mostly proud. We also remember that these pioneers were not perfect. They made mistakes. They were sinners. And Presbyterians had ways of dealing with people that acted outside of the standardized norms. Did you know that it used to be, and there are minutes of session at Hopewell reflecting this, that before communion was served, usually quarterly back then, the elders, the session, would meet together and review the role of the church. And if there was anybody on that role that they thought had not been good in keeping the faith or had gotten in trouble, they would not permit them to take the sacrament. They would bar them from the table until they came to the church confessed and said they would do better and then prove that they would. So this was a really strict time in that history. My prayer for you all is hopefully, and I know there's not many of us here today, which is discouraging, but that some of us will appreciate this history and that it might help us in our Lenten preparation for the coming of Holy Week and Easter. Next week, in this church, you will notice the difference in denominational traditions and worship liturgy and style, as we will combine elements of our Presbyterian denomination with the Church of God of prophecy of the Believer's Church. But we are all Christians. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is the first and most important thing. My prayer for you is that Holy Week and Easter this year will make a real meaningful difference in your spiritual lives. Let us not turn to God together in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for those that came before us who were willing to risk their very lives and the lives of their precious children just to be in a place where they could be free. Lord, we thank you for their willingness to live in hardship 
to endure the struggles of the frontier and to lack for basic things such as shelter and sometimes even clean, pure water. Lord, help us, we pray, to look back upon them with gratitude, even as we look forward to the future that you have for us here in this place at this time. For, Father, we know that we are the present-day stewards of this faith tradition. We are the ones who must maintain it and seek to improve it, that it might move forward in your grace and through your power. We pray these things together in his holy name. Amen. Our final hymn is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, which talks about the Christian love that we share. Let us stand together, please, as we sing these words from Galatians, the third chapter. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of you now and forevermore. Amen.